Sunday today, so you got me. Uh, and we appreciate your being here. Uh, we have a special guest here today. Our daughter Angie is here uh, from San Antonio. Uh, I could tell you how special she is, but it would take the whole class period. Uh, and so uh, just just take my word for it. She's uh, very special, and we're, we're very proud of her. She's going to be with us to, through this week, uh, working remotely from uh, Idaho, uh, but, <coughs> but that'll work for us. Uh, just a reminder, some things that are coming up. Uh, the prayer breakfast is in a couple of weeks, uh, Saturday the 16th. We got our community giveaway coming up, coming up as well. The food drive for the Mountain State uh, Children's Home. Men's retreat, women's retreat, all kind of things going up. Spring is a busy time here at uh, Linda Road, and we uh, look forward to all those activities and the opportunities that they give us to uh, strengthen our faith and uh, and our relationship with each other. Uh, Jeremy's going to lead our prayer for us this morning. Any any particular prayer request we need to be aware of? No. Okay, Jeremy. Thank you, sir. Clint uh, has been leading us for the last several weeks through uh, the orientation psalms, those happy psalms, those, those psalms that are full of praise and adoration and uh, acknowledgement of God's goodness and God's greatness, and those are the psalms we like. We like to remember when peace like a river attends our way. But we try to avoid those times when sorrows like sea billows roll. And the psalms we're going to be looking at today will be those types of psalms. They're called the disorientation psalms. Those psalms in which the writer is angry, uh, he's frustrated, he's in despair, uh, and he cries out, we like blue skies and rainbows. Uh, we like sing and be happy. Well, that's not going to be the tone uh, in these two psalms today. We're going to be looking at Psalm 88 and Psalm 109. Uh, the psalmist in each of these two uh, feels very disconnected with God. Uh, he's in despair. Uh, why, why would we include psalms like this in the scriptures? Why, why are they there if they're so, uh, I don't hesitate to say negative, but they're negative. Why, why are they in there? Why, why not just leave those out? Huh? We, we, that's that's life. Uh, li life is full of despair, and, and anger, and frustration, and questions about why things are happening to us. Uh, and so this will give us some insight into how to deal with those kinds of situations. And and even when he's hurting, and even when he's uh, feeling abandoned, uh, he continues to reach out to God even in in those times. Uh, these psalms are sometimes described as problem psalms, and I think as we go through it, you'll, you'll see why they might be uh, described as prob problem psalms. Um, so as, as we look at these two psalms, the, uh, both of the psalmists in Psalm 88 and Psalm 109 wrestle with the question of why. Why are these things happening? Why are they happening to me? God, why are you allowing these things to happen? Uh, and, and I think when we find ourselves in these disoriented times, we wrestle with that same question. Uh, God, if you're good and great and merciful and kind and loving, then why am I experiencing these terrible times and terrible things? Uh, and, and the psalmist are going to kind of give us some insights into that. God, why have you 
as we see in, in Psalm 88, God, why have you done these terrible things to me? He's blaming God for his, his misery. I'm miserable and you're the cause of it. And in the second one, we'll see the psalmist say, God, these people are being mean to me. They're, they're mistreating me and abusing me, and you need to do something about that. You need to get them. And here's how you need to get them. I, I've got a plan. I've got some very serious, specific recommendations of how you ought to deal with these people. Uh, and I hope you, you take care of that. Uh, so uh, the, in, in these two Psalms, strong, emphatic recommendations to God about why he should do what he should do. And so as we find ourselves in these disoriented situations, we too tend to ask, why? Why, God, uh, are, are these things happening? Maybe you don't know, but that couldn't be right. God, you're omniscient. You know everything. You know when I get up in the morning. You know when I go to bed at night. I can't escape your presence. I go into the top of the mountain, and you're there. I go into the depths of the sea, and you're there. there there's no escaping. So I know you know that I'm struggling. Maybe you know, but you can't do anything about it. Maybe this is beyond your pay grade. Well, that can't be right either, because, God, you're omnipotent. Uh, you're you're all-powerful. And so you could fix this if you would. But if you know, and you can fix it, and you choose not to, what does that say? You don't care. That can't be right either. God, you're all loving, compassionate. That's the perception I have of you. And so that's the most demoralizing of all. God, where are you when I'm struggling, when I'm hurting, when I'm abandoned? Uh, I cry out, I get no answer. Uh, ever been there? Say yes. Uh, we all have. We've all been in those situations, and, and we've wondered, where, where is God during these difficult, troubled times? Uh, <clears throat> this book you may be familiar with, it's, it's been around quite a while. It was published in 1981, which is way before some of you were published. Uh, but it's got some good thoughts to it. The author is a man named Harold Kushner. Uh, he's a Jewish rabbi, and he serves a congregation in the uh, metropolitan Boston area. <clears throat> and in that role, he's often asked required to, to give sympathy, condolences, comfort to people, families, individuals who suffered tragedy. Uh, some, some kind of upset in, in their lives. For example, he remembered talking to a, a, a parents whose 19-year-old daughter had just dropped dead while walking to class on her college campus. And he goes and he tries to console those parents, and, and they want to know why. How, how did this happen? She seemed to be a very healthy, vibrant young lady, and yet uh, she just dropped dead. She had an aneurysm that was uh, undiagnosed, and it, it ruptured, and it, she's just gone. And, and they're, they're wrestling with, how could this happen? And, and the dad, just grasping for any kind of explanation, said, you know, last year at Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement, the highest of the high holy days for the Jews. And he said, we didn't fast that day. Maybe that's God's punishment that he took our daughter. And, and the rabbi said, no, that, that God doesn't work that way. If, if that had been the case, half our congregation would have had some kind of tragedy. Uh, but, but they were just trying to find some way that they could find a reasonable, rational explanation as to why this could happen. And then he, he tried to, tried to deal, uh, deal with a, a middle-aged lady who'd been uh, diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. She's losing her mobility. And she said, why would God do this to me? My, my children need me and my husband needs me. 
And then she felt guilty for being angry with God. And, and so it, 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 we, we find ourselves in these kinds of situations, and, and we want to know why. And then it came his turn. He and his wife had a, had a, had a child, a, a son, and there was some concern from the very beginning about how small he was. And, and as time passed, he's not growing and developing as children normally do. And finally, at age three, he's diagnosed with a condition called progeria, rapid aging. Even as a child, he's going to look like an old man. He will never be more than three feet tall, and he will die in his early to mid-teens. And now the rabbi finds himself struggling with God. His perception that God was all wise, uh, all powerful, all compassionate, loving, fair. This can't be happening. This can't be happening to our family. Uh, why, why would you do this, God? Why would you do this to this innocent child? And he said, you know, the whole thing became totally different when it happened to me. And I could understand how these families and these individuals were grappling with why. And so he writes this book, and it deals mostly with the book of Job. Uh, and, and Job wrestles with this same question. All the adversity that he's, he's experienced, now uh, he's, he's wrestling with. And so Psalm 88 seems to be uh, asking this same question and dealing with these same issues. Who writes this? Who writes this psalm? Well, it's identified, and you probably see a note there in your, in your Bibles. It's written by a man named Heman the Ezraite. Uh, He's also identified as one of the sons of Korah. I found this picture of him, by the way, on eBay. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, he's a, he's a very unusual man. You know the story of Korah? Say yes. Who's Korah? Anybody, come on, one at a time. Let's go. Don't, you don't know Korah? We read about him in the book of Numbers. And the Israelites had just come out of, uh, out of bondage, <clears throat> and they're kind of getting organized as a nation. And one of the things they do is designate Aaron as the high priest. Well, Korah doesn't like that. I don't know whether he thought he should have been that job, but anyway, he, he questions uh, Moses, and he's got 250 followers. And what happens to Korah? The earth opens up and just swallows him and all of his 250 followers. But three of his sons repented and survived, and their descendants become very prominent in Jewish history. Samuel, for example, is a descendant of Korah. And the, they are also involved in, in writing, uh, let's see, how many, uh, uh, 11 of the, of the 150 Psalms. Some of them are some of the best known ones. Psalm 42, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you, written by one of the sons of Korah. God is our refuge, our strength, and very times of trouble, Psalm 46, written by the sons of Korah. And so they play a, a very prominent role, but they ask this question, and the two that we'll look at, of why. Why is God allowing this to happen? We know a little bit about this man. He, uh, he's described as a man of great wisdom. When Solomon asked for, for wisdom from God, God granted it to him, and we've got a little notation there in 1 Kings that says Solomon had more wisdom, and he names all four or five people, and one of them is this man, which implies that he was one of the wisest men in the whole kingdom. So here's a man who's highly intelligent. He's a talented musician. He organized those, those singing guilds that, that David used in the worship in the temple. 
So a talented man. He's got an exceptional family. He's got 14 sons and three daughters. That's exceptional. Uh, but, but, also the, the, but it implies that uh, they're kind of outstanding. Uh, he's provided great service to the king. So here's a man that you, if you look at these characteristics here, he's got, he's got his life together. He's, he's got a lot of good things going for him. Uh, wise, talented, exceptional, valuable service to the king, and yet he says, my life is full of troubles. You know, there are probably lots of people that we encounter on a regular basis who seem outwardly to really have everything going for them, but internally their life is full of troubles. And they, they hide it. They, they, you, you, you never know it, that what, what's going on in their lives. My soul is full of trouble. He mentions his sins. He mentions his sorrows. He mentions his fears. He mentions his woes. And he lays his case before God. And he begins with the opening line of, O oh Lord, my God, who saves me? Now, you might expect, well, here's another orientation song. He, he, he's going to laud all the positive attributes of God. He's going to praise God. God's great. God's good. God's gracious. But that's the only positive thing in this whole song. He's in desperation. This is the only glimmer of light in this otherwise dark song. It's a lament from the deepest pit. He complains, and it's a perpetual complaint. He said, I cry out night and day, night and day. And that word cry out suggests it's a scream. Uh, it's, it's intense. Uh, it's uh, a cry of anguish. It's a cry of help. It's persistent. The image here is almost that he's shaking his fist at God. Uh, ever been there? I think we all have at times. When things are going on that we just can't understand uh, and, and God, th this is contrary to everything, every concept I have of who, who you are. Uh, and I'm, I'm not understanding. My life is upside down. Uh, I'm, I'm drowning. And God, if I cry loud enough and long enough, maybe you'll hear me. Uh, I'm a dead man walking. I'm overwhelmed with your wrath, and I'm sinking under your waves. See anything positive out of that? Can, can you make anything good out of that desperate cry? Come on, y'all got to talk. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Even, even in this despair... He cries out to God. Uh, that's, that's, he, he kind of implies that that's my only hope, that I'm going to get this fixed. You're the only one who can address my, my problems and my issues and my struggles and, and, and whatever. So, so it, it's kind of a, uh, an indication uh, of, of his faith. Uh, he's not willing to just accept his misery but he puts it in God's hands. Maybe an example for us. Say again? Sure, sure. Right. Good point. Uh, Friends have abandoned him uh, because of his uh, 
He says, it's, it's like I have a loathsome disease. Uh, and I'm afflicted, and I'm all by myself. This situation that I'm in is so bad that my friends regard me as, as near death. And so the only hope that he has is, is uh, to pray, to pray in a loud, screaming voice to manage his feelings of despair and abandonment. Uh, any other thoughts about that? About that concept? Yeah, Dana. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Last and third of all. Yeah, that, that is our, our tendency. He does give uh, uh, God reason why you ought to step in and help me. Because... He said, God, I'm one of your best worshipers. And if I die, you're going you're gonna to lose one of your biggest fans. <laughs> trying, trying to kind of bargain with God. As if God needs our worship. I, I think we kind of fool ourselves with this. That, that God doesn't need our worship. Our worship is for our benefit, not for God's benefit. It reminds us of who he is and what he is. And it reminds us of our dependence on him. And so when we pray and when we offer our various forms of worship, it's for us. It's not for him. He, he doesn't need that uh, as, as great as he is. Uh, and, and our feeble efforts. And so sometimes we do try to uh, bargain with God. And, and that's kind of what he's saying here. Uh, God, your, your reputation is on the line, uh, and so you, you need to step in here and, and uh, take care of this for your sake, not just for my sake. Any other thoughts regarding that? Excuse me? Yeah. Right. But if you let me die, I, I can't save you. Right. Like, in your, your glory's not going to be right. seen by someone who's dead. Right. So do something about it. Really, fix it. <laughs> yeah. We, we see, beginning in verse 6, we see a shift. The first five verses, he used first person pronouns. I, me, my. Beginning in verse 6, it's you. And who is the you? Well, the you is God. Uh, God, uh, he's not faulting God for not stepping in to resolve his troubles, but he's accusing God of causing his troubles. God, you have brought me low. My life is upside down. Uh, nothing makes sense. I'm in utter hopelessness and helplessness. I'm overwhelmed. I've cut off, I'm rejected, I'm in despair, I'm estranged from my friends, and it's all you're doing. Uh, he questions God's goodness, but he continues to pray. Why would he question God as the cause of his troubles? Yeah, Jeremy? Right. Right.
Good point. I, I think that's often the case. And, and the assumption, in, particularly in these times, what happens when Job's friends come to him? Job, you're suffering all these things. What horrible, terrible things you must have done. Because we all know the wicked suffer. And the wicked always suffer. And the wicked are the only ones who suffer. So you must have done some terrible, awful thing to deserve all this punishment. Remember John 9, this blind man. Who sinned that this man should be blind? So that was a common assumption. Is that a valid assumption? Sometimes. Sometimes I suffer because I do stupid things. Right. Right. So sometimes, sometimes I suffer because other people do stupid things. Sometimes I suffer just because we live in a broken world. Uh, but I, I think your your point is is well taken here. That may, maybe I've done some terrible thing that deserves God's wrath and punishment. Uh, but. Right. So to recognize it's God's wrath that caused you to me there's there's a there's a balance there. You recognize you've done something wrong. Sure. You're gonna say, you know, I see your wrath upon me. Right. Um, and then in, in the next chapter or in the in a couple of months or a year you're gonna say, Well, you've always been faithful. So yeah. Sure. Yeah. Because that's kind of our point in time, and then praise is God because God removes His wrath from us, and there's no. There's no more benefit. And, and I think it's just it's okay to challenge God and to question God and to to, to ask Him what's going on. Why why is this happening? Uh, you know, you don't take this out of the book because because of these kind of uh, questions that, that come up. Uh, well, I don't also think I, you don't write this after you're out of it. Either. Right, you write it while you're in the middle of it. When you're in the middle, of it, when you're after, you're, when you're through this and everything comes to glory. Yeah. You know, it's not going to be as sharp. It's not going to be as painful. It's not going to be as, as pertinent. Sure. That's the time to voice it. What about his friends? He got none. He got one. Who's his friend? My only friend is darkness. Remember Simon and Garfunkel? Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk to you again. Uh, and he said, that's the only friend I've got is darkness. Uh, well, you're in a bad shape if that's your only friend. Uh, Clint has shared with us the fact that these psalmists, they, they have a, a formula, a template, as it were, to write the Psalms, and you got a step one and step two and step three, and the last step is some kind of positive comments. Even the disoriented Psalms have that. Some kind of statement of praise, acknowledgement of God's goodness. This one doesn't have that. There is no positive close. Uh, and if that's left off, 
That was intentional. That was on purpose. He didn't, he didn't just forget about it. Uh, my situation is so bad that I can't bring myself to offer any positive words. And maybe that's uh, understandable when your only friend is darkness. But because he is silent does not mean that God is absent. Uh, and sometimes we pray and pray and pray and pray and get no response. It seems like we get no response. And we get frustrated and we get discouraged. So what do you get out of this psalm? What, what, does, it, what does it say to us? Lord, you're the God who saves me. I, I think even though day and night I call out unto you, uh, he acknowledges his, help, his, uh, his hope for salvation. Uh, even when God appears to be silent or absent. It shows us even in the midst of our worst circumstances, still possible to talk to God. Still have a relationship with him. Remember the psalmist is praying here. Now he's not praying happy thoughts. Uh, and in spite of his perception that God has caused his troubles, he still believes God is close. Uh, and God can hear him. Paul says to the Philippians, in everything by prayer and supplication, make your request known. Yeah, Danny. Yeah, even in his darkest times. Uh, any other thoughts before we move on? We gotta, don't have much time left to get to the other one. Okay, uh, but Psalm 88, I think, is a, a reminder of the profound suffering and despair. They're just part of our life. That's just the, 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 the world we live in part of the human experience. And even in the midst of pain and perceived abandonment, the, uh, the psalm, this psalmist continues to reach out to God, which speaks to his faith uh, and, and his hope. Uh, it encourages us to pour out our hearts to God in all situations, even if, he, if it feels our prayers are falling on deaf ears. Our God is a God who hears. Uh, and uh, he's with us in every season including the darkest ones. Okay. And here's a, here's a passage from the New Testament that Paul says basically the same thing. He, he writes in his second letter to the Corinthians, don't be uninformed. We were under great pressure beyond our ability to endure. We despaired of our life itself. But this happened to us for a reason that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. And that's what the, the psalmist in Psalm 88 is doing. Okay, next psalm, Psalm 109, an imprecatory psalm. This psalmist is saying, God, do something. These people are being mean to me, and you need to take care of them. Get them. Uh, and I've got some very specific things. Uh, that, that you need to do to them. Um, seems to depict uh, an angry man uh, who's uh, suffering at, at the hands of, of people. He, he's kind of a tattletale. Uh, these rebels are described as not only enemies of him, but, but enemies of God. And so he's going at it from the idea of, God, you need to do some justice here. When, when the people violate your laws, they need to be punished, not, not just for my benefit. But not only injustice is done to me, but to God himself. Uh, and there are other examples of people in, in Scripture who, who call on God to punish people. It's ought to be written by David, this Psalm 109. And it's written to the chief musician, kind of the choir director of, of the temple singers. And it is the strongest of these imprecatory psalms where we call down curses against personal enemies. 
Um, God, I need some vindication, he says. Um, what are these people doing? Well, they're speaking lying tongues. They're, they're telling things about me and saying things about me that are not true. And we've probably all been in that situation. Um, these, these people are wicked. They're evil. They're also speaking words of hate. Well, I think we can identify that in our culture today. Uh, these are deceitful people. Uh, they're rotten scoundrels. They're, they're attacking me without cause. They don't have any reason to do this. I'm a good guy. And, and yet they're, they're saying all these bad things about me. They're jerks. Uh, they're, they're scumbags. They, these are godless people. And they're returning evil for good. I'm praying for these people, and here's how they respond with, with evil actions. Uh, so, God, here's what you need to do. He, he's not suggesting that God do something. God, do this. And here's his recommendation. Look at the things he wants. And this is from the message. Kind of puts it in some modern day language. I need a special prosecutor for these people. And we don't really need a trial. We just need to pronounce them guilty. Uh, no, no need to waste time on that. Uh, take his life. Just, just kill him. Or give him a short life. Not just him, but his whole family. Make his, uh, make his children orphans. His wife is a widow. Uh, and, and the children are gonna, just going to become beggars in the streets because the repo man is coming. Take, take all their assets, all their goods. They're not going to have anything. The bank is going to foreclose, wipe him out. We're going to chop down his family tree. Step in and work a miracle for me. Uh, and you can do it. I'm at the end of my rope. Uh, I'm fading away. I'm getting old before my time because of these situations that I find myself in. Uh, cut off his posterity. No one to carry his name. And don't even for, forgive the iniquity of his mother and father. We're going to get them all. Uh, but he's not only guilty for the things that he's done, he's also not done some things that he should have done. Uh, he, he's been, he's abused the uh, poor and the needy. He's pronounced curses on people. So why don't you just clothe him in, pers in, in curses, uh, like, like his garments. Uh, but he closes with the admonition of God help me, <clears throat> I am needy. Uh, still, even in his frustration, in his despair, he's crying out to God. Hadn't lost his faith, but God, you're the only help that I have in the, in the mess that I'm in. So would you take care of my enemies uh, for your sake as well as for my sake. Is that okay? Okay to ask God to do that? Yes, no, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right.
for his name. He gives judgment and gives salvation. And let us share every kind of sin. So but when he is judged, when he goes to pray for you, actually, yeah. it means that other people have asked. Don't for listen to him. <laughs> yeah, his prayers are. <laughs> yeah, his, his prayers are void. Yeah, yeah. He said, I, "You know, this this experience has damaged my health. I've got weak knees. I'm gaunt in my appearance. I'm scorned by my accusers. I plead for God's mercy in my in my soul." But he closes with a prayer of thanksgiving. Uh, he acknowledges that God stands to help the needy and save them from enemies who would condemn them to death. But he leaves this to God. He said, I'm not going to kill him. I'm not going to take out all his family. God, that's your business. Uh, but please do it. Uh, so it's a, it, this is a puzzling part. So I think you can see why these might be called problem psalms. This, this kind of contrary to everything that we, that we hold as, as Christians. You pray for your enemy. Uh, you bless those who curse you. Uh, it, it, it just seems to be just the total opposite of, of, of those things that we try to, to that we try to comply with uh, as as Christians. Anything else? We're about out of time here. So, kind of a combination of justice and revenge in, in this psalm. Okay, uh, I assume Clint will be back. You're not on again, Adam, are you? No? Okay. I assume uh, Clint will be back next week, and thank you for your attention and your comments, and we will see you next week.